Hi everyone, this is Tom with the Safe and Ready Institute at safeandready.org, the online platform for safety and emergency preparedness training, which features instruction from national experts. Today I am joined by an expert, Donald Schmidt, CEO of Preparedness LLC, and he will present on the basics of business continuity and IT recovery. Don has more than 35 years of experience working with some of the largest companies in the world. His specialties include risk assessment, loss prevention, hazard mitigation, emergency management, business continuity, and crisis management. He is past chair of the technical committee that writes USA's National Preparedness Standard, NFPA 1600, the Standard on Disaster, Emergency Management, and Business Continuity, and Continuity of Operations Programs. He is also a member of the USA's Technical Advisory Group to the ISO Security and Resiliency Committee, and he's a member of ASTM's Homeland Security Committee. He's an instructor for the Disaster Recovery Institute and Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency, and he is visiting full professor in the Graduate Studies Department of the Massachusetts Maritime Academy. He is the editor, co-author, or contributing author of six books including Implementing NFPA 1600, National Preparedness Standard, Business at Risk, How to Assess, Mitigate, and Respond to Terrorist Threats, and Tools and Techniques of Risk Management. He has attained professional certifications in risk management, emergency management, business continuity, and auditing. And believe it or not, this is just his abbreviated bio. Don, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your knowledge with this audience. Thank you, Tom. Uh, good day, everyone. It's uh, great to be here. Thank you for joining us. And I've got about 45 minutes here to talk about business continuity and IT disaster recovery planning, um, a big, big topic. So I'm going to go through key elements, and then I'm also going to point you to some other information and resources that you can use to further develop your program, implement your program, and certainly evaluate your program. So I'll be pointing those out as we go along. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll talk about some of those, including um, one resource that's just been updated and posted for today's webinar. So let's get started. Uh, one of the first things I like to start with is terminology. Um, oftentimes I get a question, I want to develop a disaster plan or a contingency plan, a crisis plan. Um, and I always have to ask them some follow-up questions to drill down and, and understand what they're asking for. So when we talk about business continuity and disaster recovery, what does that mean? So I presented on the slide a couple of different definitions. Uh, one is the first one from NFPA 1600, and then the middle definition from DRI's Professional Practices for Business Continuity Practitioners and the third definition from the Disaster Recovery Journal, which is a, a publication, and that definition has also been incorporated into the DRI's International Glossary for Resiliency. So if we focus on business continuity, highlighted a couple words, understanding impacts, because business continuity is trying to, to deal with impacts, and then to develop viable continuity and recovery strategies. And I'm gonna focus on that today. Um, DRI's definition in the middle you know, points to understanding risk and threats and vulnerabilities and also brings up the terminology of organizational resilience. And if you think about it, if you've got a really good business continuity program, IT disaster recovery program, a well-coordinated, uh, built into the culture of your organization, then you should be able to achieve a high level of resiliency. You know, nobody's perfect, but our goal is to continue to mature our program so we can achieve the highest level of resiliency that we can afford. And bottom line, it's all about how much time and money you can invest into the program. And I'll come back to that a little bit later on. The third definition I point out, disaster recovery, it really speaks to the recovery of information and communications technologies. Really, that definition has its roots in the fact decades ago when the data center was, you know, the, in a locked room and, and we didn't have computers on our desktops. And I know that's ancient history for many of us, but um, 
realized we need to have a disaster plan. So the terminology has its historical roots decades ago when we had those mainframe computers. Um, they're still out there, but most of you probably have server rooms now with many, many different servers. So just want to cover some of the basic definitions there um, and some sources if you want to dig in further. Okay, in today's webinar, I want to focus on some key elements, key elements of your business continuity and your IT disaster recovery program. And if I focus in on the word continuity, there are high priority processes that need to continue, maybe in your IT environment, and you have a failover, so something fails, and you're able to continue that, that process. Um, many cases, we have to, there's a failure, and then we gotta come back and recover, and there may be some time lag there, or maybe it's long-term recovery. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. But you see on your screen, you know, 10 key elements. I'm going to cover each of these in, in greater detail. Management, commitment, direction, support, certainly critical. And there should be that policy statement that covers that. And it's widely disseminated within your organization. Many of you, I suspect, have some responsibility for your programs while you're on this webinar. So you have that responsibility of program management and your ability to be able to pull together a good team and, and manage the development, the implementation, and then the ongoing review and updating and improvement of your program, critically important. So we'll talk about your role in your team members. We'll dig a little bit into risk assessment, understanding that you have to understand what can happen, and many, many different hazards. And we'll talk about natural hazards and human caused, uh, uh, acts and, and so forth, but lots of potential causes, but understanding what can happen. And I'm going to focus it in on uh, resources, the impact on the resources that you need to continue to provide services, manufacture your product, you know, whatever you do at your organization. I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on business impact analysis. That analysis is understanding where the priorities are in your organization. Um, and understanding the resources required to be able to have that process up and running um, and how to go through that, that analysis to understand the prioritization of recovery, the resource requirements, and so forth. Um, business continuity largely depends upon time and resources. So we're going to focus in on that needs assessment. What resources do you need? Where would the resource be available and so forth? The continuity strategies, we'll talk at a high level about strategies and how to go about developing those strategies. A little bit of art there and a certain amount of science will try to merge the two together. I'm not gonna talk a lot about incident management, but when something happens, you need to have that capability within your organization to be able to manage, detect that there's a, a problem, an interruption, a disruption, activate, execute those strategies and manage the, the execution of those strategies. So like in emergency management, there's an incident management component to business continuity and disaster recovery. Certainly imp implementation of your program, education, training, testing exercises, we'll briefly cover that and uh, we'll wrap up with the program reviews, the continuous improvement process. I want to start off and emphasize, and this goes back in you know the decades I've been doing this, about management commitment, direction, and support. You know, if you don't have it, boy, it's going to be much more difficult to be able to develop your program. The program is never going to be great. Um, it may, may miss a lot of things, may not have the support for the resources you need for, for continuity and recovery. So I, I really emphasize how important it is to be able to make a case for senior management for their commitment to the program, their funding for resources, you know, your role and the others need to be involved, the resources needed for your for your strategies, um, open the doors to the people within your organization that need to participate in this. I'll cover that in a minute, but without management saying this is important, you've got to be involved, you may get half-hearted or lukewarm support. You're not going to get the, imp the input that you need to really build your program. Management from the high level, understand the business, where the business is going. As the graphic shows, 
what direction are we going in? It's going to be very, very important to uh, uh, be able to understand um, where the priorities are in the business continuity and the ITDR program. And the last bullet point of building a culture of preparedness, that's, that's crucial. You know, when I've had the opportunity to work with companies over multiple years, um, and I can see that a lot of things to be tackled in the, in the first um, phase of their program, um, I see them, you know, a year later, two years later, let's say capital budgeting and capital expenditures, building in greater redundancy and interoperability in their processes so that if they have a failure, they have greater ability to be able to transfer production to another uh, production line, to another facility. And so the light bulbs were going off and now they're building in that um, you know, prevention, mitigation, business continuity into their thinking. But one of the challenges there certainly is to be able to, to make a good business case for business continuity, why it's important. We'll cover a couple of those things in the upcoming slides. Understanding the business. It's one of the first modules in the graduate course that I teach. You know, certainly understanding your organization's mission and vision and so forth at a high level. Um, but now drilling down and, and take a look at the value stream. You know, what is it you do, but what really generates value for your customers or whoever you serve if you're in a non nonprofit or government agency? Really understanding what is it that you need to, to do. Um, Certainly in a for-profit business, we're gonna look at sales. We're gonna look at profitability. If you look at the two pie charts on the screen, you know, you look and say, well, product A, that's 50% of our sales, that's gonna be our number one priority. But then we look over profitability and we see that product A is only, you know, it's less than one quarter of our, our profits. So what's the priority, A? Or is it B that generates more profits? But then if we look down into the um, the sales projections over multiple years, you can see that um, product D is emerging. Um, but collectively, looking at this information, we can get a, a sense of where the priorities are, not only today, but where are we going. Hopefully, you have great insight provided by the senior leadership in your organization in terms of where the priorities are. Um, where's the growth within the organization? Um, I look at research and development is very, very important, and it points to future growth, future revenue opportunities, new products, services, whatever. Um, hopefully, if you've got the ear, you've got the input of senior leaders, you're going to be able to understand where the priorities are, and you can focus your business continuity planning efforts in those directions. Um, I think back of, you know, one project I did within the last year or so, I got a CFO for one hour. And that one hour was so valuable because I knew at the end of that hour exactly where the priorities were. And it saved a lot of time in the subsequent days and weeks because we weren't you know, chasing down different parts of the company that were relatively unimportant. And it comes back to the fact that business kind of, you can't do everything, you can't plan for everything. So we gotta understand what those priorities are. Certainly you gotta be in tune with your customers, you got to understand the regulations. There are many regulations out there. I know we've got at least one healthcare professional on the phone. Um, clearly, there's regulations there, new CMS regulations, financial services, a lot of regulations. And all of us you know, have to deal with information security regulations. So those may be drivers um, for your business. And the goal here is to understand the business, understand the requirements, so you build your program accordingly. Many of you have responsibility for certain aspects of your program. So congratulations, but also my condolences because you got a lot of responsibility. Hopefully senior leadership has vested you with the authority you need to, to build a program. Of course, they should be holding you accountable. That's part of it. Um, but they are providing the keys to open up the doors of all these other department heads or professionals from other parts of your, your business, of your organization so that you've got the requisite input that you need. Um, now, you may not call it, be called a program coordinator, it may not be your program committee, substitute whatever labels you want, but you wanna be able to build a team that has the institutional knowledge to be able to uh, build that program, provide the input. Uh, you can't do it all yourself, so you're also gonna have people that are going to um, 
um, help you to build a program, help you to implement the program, and, and help you in the periodic review of that program. There are others that could be on this list, and maybe some here they want to take away, but you know, I think the big point here is um, to be able to look through your organization. I look at an org chart and, and try to pick out the people I think are going to be key players, and then try to build my team ar around that. Take a look at risk assessment, um, understanding what can happen. Um, and that would be understanding uh, vulnerabilities or weaknesses, um, understanding how different scenarios could impact the resources that you need for business continuity and ITDR. So if we take a look at certainly natural hazards, um, impact to a facility, but also could be impacting a region where you have multiple buildings, you have multiple facilities. Um, and so we need to understand there are many scenarios where multiple facilities may be impacted. So if we're looking for resources uh, for our continuity and recovery strategies, we may need to look uh, a greater distance away. Um, also understanding that there are technology failures in the infrastructure, power and telecommunications and so forth. Um, we look at pandemic. You now, back in 2009, we had swine flu, H1N1, and this concern about avian flu. You know, how does that factor in business continuity? I think one of the things that you need to, to decide early on is what are going to be your planning scenarios? Are you going to plan for the loss of one of your buildings? Are you going to, to plan for a scenario where you lose a campus of buildings that are unavailable? Are you going to plan for an extended power failure? Uh, are you going to plan for a pandemic? Um, understanding, developing your scenarios and understanding um, how those scenarios will impact the resources that you need for continuity and recovery is, is going to be a fundamental that you need to decide early on. Because if, if you don't um, plan for certain scenarios and they occur, um, then you may find that your plan does not address the impacts of that scenario that you did not plan for. Now you may be you know, kind of raising your hands and saying, wow, there's so many different scenarios. Yes, that's true. So typically a starting point is, is to look at your facility you're planning for and look at what is a reasonable loss scenario, foreseeable. Maybe a low probability, but what's foreseeable? Typically plan for a loss of the building and anything within that building. And we'll assume that people are okay. Now, there are other scenarios such as pandemic where people may not be available because they're sick. Um, so typically, we're going to have a number of different scenarios that we plan for. Now, those of you in the IT arena, you're probably focused on your IT, um, your, your networks, your connectivity, and, and so forth. Uh, and maybe you're focused within that. But here's a case to make sure you're coordinating with, with whoever is dealing with risk or from a larger perspective. So don't have a lot of time to, to drill down into risk assessment. In the bottom right hand corner of the slide, you'll see a little image there of a, a paper that I've written. It's like a chapter from a book on risk assessment. If you go to the preparedessllc.com website, go under the resources link and bulletins, and you'll be able to download that bulletin as well as a couple others that I'll mention. And that'll give you a lot of great pointers on conducting that risk assessment. All right, let's get into the business impact analysis, understanding what's critical. You can't plan to recover everything. You'd have, you'd have to have total redundancy. So trying to figure out what's critical. What's the prioritization of recovery within your organization? Um, so we need to understand what are the potential impacts, you know, loss of sales, is it deferred profits or lost profits? Is it loss of customers, market share? Is it a regulatory issue? Is it a contractual issue? You know, many different categories are examples of impacts. But we're trying to quantify impacts and some things we can't quantify, like you know, customer dissatisfaction. Um, but if we can identify and quantify to the best of our ability potential impacts, then we can use those impacts to help us in our prioritization of recovery. So understanding impacts, but also understanding when do those impacts occur? You know, can production be down for a day and you've got sufficient inventory 
that you can continue to fulfill orders. And as long as you're back up and running in a day, there's really no impact. Or if we take a look in the IT arena, take a look at some Wall Street trading firm. If they're down for as much as a minute, how many millions of dollars in trades could they lose? So we're trying to understand what are the impacts and how quickly do those impacts uh, accrue and using that information to be able to determine what we call the recovery time objective, the time that process needs to be back up and running at a minimum level to avoid those impacts. Now there's other issues such as timing. You know, Many businesses have peaks and valleys throughout the year. Think about retailers in the Christmas holiday shopping season. Um, they make the bulk of the revenue in, in maybe two or three months time period. So if something happens at that time of the year, it's gonna be a disproportionate impact on their revenue and profitability. And that's something that gets taken into consideration when you do the business impact analysis. Again, I point out it's another uh, preparedness bulletin, another chapter for that book. Um, take a look at that. There's a lot of detail on the BIA. I wanna show you a little graphic here to explain that important concept of recovery time objective or RTO. Let's say this is your normal pre-disaster production or service level. Everything's great. Uh-oh, something's about to happen. But we've gone through our business impact analysis and we've determined what is our minimum production or service level that we can't let it drop to. So when that disaster occurs and there's gonna be that natural drop in production or service level, but now you have a business continuity plan, you have strategies that you can execute within your recovery time objective and production drops, but it does not drop below that minimum acceptable level. And the goal with having that business continuity plan in place is we've avoided a lot of other you know, production downtime or service level downtime and the lost sales, the lost revenue, the lost customers associated with that. So in the BIA, we're trying to figure out um, the prioritization of recovery, how quickly does it need to be recovered, and to what extent does it need to be recovered. As I mentioned earlier, in business continuity planning, it's really about time and resources time, how quickly do we need to get back up and running at that minimum level before you know, we want to avoid those unacceptable impacts. But also, it's about resources. We need to have resources in place that are available, that are capable um, to be able to execute that strategy. So if I'm in an IT environment, I've got a server fail, and I've got another server running in parallel, and it could be you know, a thousand miles away and this mirroring of data between the two, one goes down and the other may be able to continually handle all the user's needs for that particular server and their applications on that server. Um, but if you're in a manufacturing plant, you probably don't have another manufacturing plant sitting idly by just in case. Nobody has that level of resources. But really trying to understand what resources are required um, start with people that have the institutional knowledge and so forth, the ability to do the job, the facilities, machinery and equipment today, um, more and more, um, more externally expensive, longer lead time to procure, um, customized with tooling and fixtures and dyes that are, that, uh, are very expensive and take a long time to replace. Um, so critically un uh, important to understand what are the critical machinery and equipment? Uh, what is the customization for that equipment? Many of those machines now are also computer controlled, understanding the technology of that machine, the backup of that information, just like any other computer. We talk about the, the recovery, the prioritization and recovery of processes. We also need to understand dependencies and understanding um, for this one process to be up and running, it depends upon other internal departments for maybe information, maybe it is for parts uh, along a production line. So to have a process up and running, we need to understand the internal dependencies of information or goods, whatever is required to support that process. 
because to have that critical process up and running, we need to make sure that all the dependencies are addressed to the extent necessary. So that's something you capture in the BIA, and I'll highlight that in a minute. Talk about supply chain here. There's another preparedness bulletin I encourage you to, to download and read. Um, work with some very large companies with thousands of suppliers, trying to understand which ones are critical. <clears throat> For the risk management types out there, um, understanding the supply chain, understanding uh, critical suppliers, um, and using business continuity in the BIA as a means to understand what are the critical raw materials, what are the critical parts and components, information. With that information um, gleaned from the BIA, we can use that information to help identify some of our critical suppliers. Because it's not just about which supplier you spend the most money with. It's the suppliers that provide um, information, technology services, um, or uh, raw materials component parts that are critically important for maybe that product that generates the most revenue or the greatest profitability for you. But within that paper, there are a lot of details on supply chain risk and how to go about understanding what are your, your critical suppliers. Quickly, I'll touch on vital records. Today, a lot of that's digital information, but I find filing cabinets and filing cabinets of a lot of other paper records that are still out there that are important. And part of the process of the BIA is to understand what are the vital records? Are they protected? Um, if the building burns down, would they still be protected? Oftentimes those vital records are stored in the same building, maybe in that fireproof vault. Well, maybe it's not fireproof, but understanding vital records, are they protected? Um, can they be recovered? Um, could be critically important. I could spend a lot of time talking about information and communications technologies, um, but we all understand we depend upon technology. So it's understanding the technology infrastructure coming into your buildings, as well as your server rooms and data centers and all of your computer equipment and understanding the, the single points of failure, <clears throat> developing a strategy so that you can overcome any of those points of failure and that you also have the backup strategies so that you will not lose any critical information. So conducting a BIA goes back to the priorities as articulated by your senior managers. Developing and understanding those planning scenarios it could be anything from supply chain failure, technology failure, machinery equipment failure, it could be loss to the building, maybe multiple buildings, but really having good scenarios and understanding of the scenarios, having good criteria so that you can, as you build out the business impact analysis, you're getting quality information from whoever contributes it because you've defined very specific criteria to quantify and qualify impacts so you can roll it up into one spreadsheet, if you will, and make sense of it. Now, I'm gonna talk in a minute about a kind of a total process here, but uh, very, very common to use questionnaires. I use about 15 to 20 questionnaires, depending upon who I'm talking to. Facilities would be one questionnaire, IT is another, finance another, quality is another. Um, so each of those departments that I, uh, I mentioned early on in this presentation. So there's a questionnaire specific to them. I use a workshop, get everybody around the table or sometimes by web meeting to be able to introduce the questionnaires. What are we trying to accomplish? How do they fill out the questionnaire? So we get hopefully good quality information coming back to us. I compile information uh, using spreadsheets. You can use a database, whatever, to be able to compile this information, particularly about resources, but also about impacts. Get all this information and in, I read through it, digest it, and then I conduct interviews to be able to validate information. To fill in any gaps, but challenge people on criticality. Why is this critical? What's that impact? Um, when does the timing become critical? So I can, I can understand um, the information they provided and rolled it up to, to have a very good and accurate prioritization of recovery. So this slide here, it's kind of busy. I apologize for that, but it captures a lot of information in that whole process for that business impact analysis. Talked about the questionnaire. So I'm asking questions about impacts, not providing very specific criteria. 
to quantify impacts, loss of sales, loss of revenue, deferred revenue, um, customer dissatisfaction, regulatory impacts, whatever. Identifying resources, people, facilities, machinery and equipment, et cetera. What resources do you need? How many? How many people do you need? When do you need them? Vital records, detailed requests about vital records. What are the records? What is the media type? Where is it stored? Dependencies, internal dependencies. Workarounds, I haven't mentioned that yet, kind of in the, in the strategies, but try to identify it. Are there any manual means to do an automated process? And I also ask people about what's coming, pending changes. Hopefully senior management has provided you know, some information about what's coming in the next year and so forth, but sometimes within individual departments, they can mention a, uh, a material change that could impact the business continuity planning process. So I talked about that workshop, why is this important? And one of the biggest things you have to overcome is people think business continuity planning is a veiled attempt to maybe eliminate jobs. Always have to address that concern head on and say it's about building resilience, it's about protecting jobs, it's about protecting the business. We're gonna explain what information we need and that's in a questionnaire and how to complete the questionnaire. I talked about the interviews, validating assumptions. Keep coming back to assumptions. Document the assumptions, planning scenarios, um, validate those assumptions, those scenarios. Um, filling any gaps, question criticality. Now, going through this whole process, pull all this information together from all those questionnaires, all those interviews, and ultimately you gotta come up with a report. You're gonna quantify impacts from losing various business processes. Hopefully you're able to sort those so that the greatest impacts are right at the top and so forth. And then you've identified recovery times. And a lot of that is input from the various people uh, completing the questionnaires. So you're building out that prioritization based upon impacts, based upon recovery times. You've identified resources that you're gonna need and they're gonna have to be available for that recovery strategy. You're able to prioritize everything, present this to management and gain their approval of the business impact analysis. Very important step. You do the BI well, you got great information, you've got your priorities, you know what you need, um, and hopefully you've also started talking about potential strategies so that you can then um, build those strategies out. Great segue to strategies. Now, a couple of things I wanna point out about strategies. Resources, are they available? Do those resources have the appropriate capability, capacity? What's it gonna cost? And those, you know, availability, capability, capacity, and cost, those are gonna be overriding issues. Sometimes say, people say, oh, we could transfer to another building. Okay, is that building available? It may be subject to the same natural disaster. Or you don't own it, you lease it, um, that lease is up next year. Or are we gonna use a partner's facilities? Well, maybe they need it. So availability, capability. How many people can it seat? Do those people have all of the telecommunications and, and other technology resources? Um, so I'm gonna go through those questions to be able to validate um, the resources that you need. Keep coming back to planning scenarios. You know, it's one of those recurring themes. Keep validating those planning scenarios um, and those assumptions. Um, Sometimes there's a consideration of outsourcing. Now, outsourcing can be a, a, a great strategy, but you may have to transfer some intellectual property to that third party firm to do what you want them to do. Um, that could be a, uh, um, a no-no, a non-starter, because you do not want to disclose highly confidential uh, information. Quality is a huge concern today. You know, uh, Working with one company where, um, customers have to validate the facility and the production line um, before they will accept any output from that, from that production line. So if that production line goes down, that company is not able to simply transfer to another similar facility because that alternate facility would have to be validated to produce the requisite quality to meet that customer's requirements. 
So that's very, very true in the pharmaceutical industry, um, but it's also true in many other industries. So the customer requirements, uh, and some of this is in, in um, contracts. It's spelled out in contracts. The customer has certain control over production and the quality of production. And, and certainly time is gonna be a consideration. Strategies take time to execute. The more money you throw at it, certainly you can reduce that time frame. You know, I mentioned Wall Street and their ability to operate multiple data centers that are active active and information is mirrored between them with maybe a you know, milliseconds delay. So if one data center goes down, the other data center is up and running, uh, there's a duplicate trading floor, they're able to continue to manage their trades. But that requires a high level of investment. And many of you just simply don't have that, that ability, that money and those resources. So let's take a look at some, some realistic strategies. Um, service or production goes down, working extra shifts. Overnight, weekends, that might work. Maybe you have other facilities where you can relocate or transfer operations to, that surviving site. Um, displacing lower priority operations. So for example, at that surviving site, what they do is not as profitable, not as important, then maybe you displace those people and their operations um, and the higher priority operations are then set up within that surviving site. Um, Inventory management, whether it is on the raw material side, you've got extra uh, raw materials to buffer as a safety stock against a supply chain interruption, or you're looking to have finished goods that is a buffer uh, to be able to meet customer requirements if production goes down. Um, there are a number of different strategies there in terms of inventory management, logistics management, and so forth. Mentioned uh, outsourcing or maybe partnership agreements where somebody else that does something similar to you, um, maybe they can help you out or maybe it's just they can provide space. Um, it can be a great possibility, but it also depends upon availability um, and compatibility issues that need to be worked out that can change over time. That partner, their business may be going gangbusters and they simply do not have space to accommodate you know, your needs. Um, telecommunity, working from home, very, very popular. But if people brought their laptops home, you know, when I walk around a lot of office, offices, I find that people don't take their laptops home, they lock them up. So in that situation, you know, they may not have their laptop. Or if it's a regional disaster, an ice storm, you know, some natural disaster, um, they may not have power at their home. They may not have secure connectivity. So telecommunic can work but it requires some policies in place, people take laptops home, testing to make sure that they have the secure connectivity that they require. Kind of at the bottom of the list here in terms of strategies, leasing space, repairing, rebuilding, procuring new equipment um, takes time. In some cases take months and maybe even years if we're talking about serious rebuilding of a facility. But you know, you, these are options in terms of your strategies. You gotta look at a lot of options, see what might work, and then start to drill down to build them out, working with your team, working with your experts within your own organization. All right, focused on IT disaster recovery. And I wanna zero in here on loss of information. Um, how much data can you afford to lose? You know, today, organizations are generating a tremendous volume of data on a daily basis, it's incredible. And IT is charged with backing up that information. Um, and that you know, certainly is, is costly. Um, now there's some great resources out there today. Certainly the cloud is, is now affordable, for even small and medium businesses. So there are a lot of options out there, but I go back to oftentimes I found that that information is not backed up because IT looked at, at the servers and looked at the, um, um, a lot of the, uh, the major applications and the, the data associated with those applications, but the users don't always comply. There's a lot of information on laptops, information that is not stored on folders that are backed up automatically. Uh, I take a look at the, the scientists in the R&D labs, their lab notebooks, there's paper information there. That's not digitized, it's not backed up. 
So always look at what information can we afford to lose and make sure that you can seek out and, and make sure that you identify it so it can be backed up. But there needs to be the backup and the backup must be offsite so it's not subject to the same loss that affects the primary um, data center, you know, server room, um, wherever that, that primary data is located. Um, there are a lot of strategies out there, you know, dual data centers, active, active, big solutions, costly solutions, commercial hot sites and mobile recovery centers, trailers they can bring in. So there's a whole industry out there to support you um, based upon your needs, based upon your budget, and based upon your time frame to be able to get it back up and running. But if we take away the scope, certainly IT is looking at your enterprise applications. That's center of their radar screen. Um, and looking at those productivity apps, your email and your word processing and so forth. Um, but don't forget your process control systems. Um, critically important. I mentioned earlier machinery that are computer controlled today, but they're standalone. Uh, and oftentimes, you know, they're not addressed, you know, the backup of, of their, uh, their information and their programming as frequently as it needs to be. But also there's building management systems and security systems and, and other systems that are, that are important um, to run a facility um, and need to make sure that those are addressed. So you know, take a look at the scope, um, take a look at your business needs um, and make sure that um, you've identified that you're protecting, backing up data, that you've addressed the scope of the, the, the applications um, that are the priorities. I oftentimes that there is a disconnect between the business users, their identification of their needs and the recovery of their applications and, and what IT is planned for. And I'm not, I'm not criticizing IT, it's just they've never been told in many cases. So that speaks to the coordination between business continuity planning efforts and IT disaster recovery planning efforts making sure that there's some good coordination there, good communication so that you're in sync. I want to touch on uh, training, testing, and exercises, kind of the implementation of your uh, business continuity and IT disaster recovery programming. Um, basic training for anybody who has a defined role and responsibilities. So can you alert them? How are you going to do it in the middle of the night? What are the protocols, procedures, and criteria for activation? That incident management, define roles, responsibilities. Who's in charge? You know, who really has the authority to, to make the tough decisions? And if they're not available, who steps up and succeeds them? Um, coordination internally within your site, within your business unit, your company, whatever, and then externally with any of your partners, any of your service providers, anybody that's going to be a resource to execute a strategy. So there's gotta be that coordination. Um, and then certainly the documentation of all your strategies and workarounds and so forth. Um, so you need to have good training so you can execute, but then you need to do you know, broader level exercises. You know, you probably heard about tabletops and functional exercises and orientation exercises, but really f figure out how well all the pieces of your program fit together. Do they work? Um, and you go through exercises, you'll be able to find gaps and deficiencies, help you to be able to further develop and improve your program. Um, testing, particularly in the IT area, um, if you haven't tested a failover, you don't know whether it's gonna work or not. If you've got a continuity recovery strategy, whether you're gonna relocate to another facility, um, switch from one production line to another, uh, whatever it might be, You've got to go through and test and validate. It's going to work. Um, your data backups. If you haven't tested your ability to restore from that backup and make sure all the information that's supposed to be backed up is recoverable, then you really don't know whether that's a good backup or not. Um, so testing, critically important um, to make sure and validate that what you put in place will in fact work. One of the last elements, because we're getting close on time here, and I want to leave some time for questions, is periodic program reviews. You know, we want to implement a, a continuous improvement process because change is constant. 
you know, I've identified a few triggers for program review there, certainly regulations, and you've acquired a new business, you'd invest something, um, your operations are changing, your processes are changing, technology certainly changes. So understand that change is constant and have a program in place to be able to make sure that your program continues to meet your needs. And this is not just for business continuity and IT disaster recovery, but emergency management uh, as well. And that you have a corrective action um, process to ensure that significant deficiencies are identified, communicated to somebody at a high enough level so you can take action on that. It might be funding. Um, so senior managers may need to, uh, to approve that funding. Here on a slide here, um, another preparedness bulletin on auditing your program. Um, I co-developed a, a training program for DRI, the Disaster Recovery Institute, on auditing of your emergency management business continuity program. So um, a lot of that knowledge is, is built into that bulletin. I call your attention to that. And also want to call your attention to a great resource that's available to you. Um, updated specifically, uh, timed with this webinar, uh, we've updated our self-assessment checklist. Um, so you can use our emergency management, business continuity, and crisis management self-assessment checklist. Um, it's over 200 questions, drills down to all aspects of your program. Um, printed out, it's about, I don't know, 26, 27 pages now. It's based upon NFPA 1600, the National Preparedness Standard. And uh, if you go to the preparednesslc.com website, go to the resources, and uh, you'll see it under the preparedness bulletins. Um, and that's a screen capture on the right-hand side of your screen. On the left-hand side of the screen is a compilation of hundreds and hundreds of, of links to emergency management, business continuity, and crisis management resources on the internet. And with the launch of our new website this year, we went through and curated all the links that we've accumulated over the years, and we put them into categories. So each one of these um, blue, um, Rectangles on the screen is a category. You click on that and you'll see a drop down list of many uh, links. Um, and the links are government sources, some great insurance company links, um, not a lot of commercial links. We try to keep this non commercial, um, but there's great information there that will help you to further develop your program, implement your program, their training and other exercise resources there, as well as to review your program. Um, looking at my watch, I think it's uh, time for me to, to take a few questions from all of you. So I'm going to turn this back over to, uh, to Tom to field any of the, the questions that have been posed. Tom? Okay, Tom's not there. Let me see if I can take a look at the, uh, the chat here and see what's been posted. Somebody posted here, I'm just trying to read through this. Um, somebody looking for a decision matrix. Um, you know, I've seen a number of different decision matrix that are out there um, regarding a, uh, activation. Um, I, I boil it down to some good flow charts, and then from there, flow charts uh, that would include very good criteria in terms of what are the potential impacts. Um, if somebody wants to contact me separately, I can uh, maybe point you to some of those examples. All right, somebody from a um, mineral community hospital. Um, still don't have a good idea on COOP, if I'm reading that correctly. Um, I think that business continuity equates very, very closely to, um, um, to, to business continuity, but there are some, some critical differences between the two. Um, first off, if we take a look at continuity of operations, um, there are statutory requirements for public agencies, and that may dictate um, you know, continuity and recovery requirements. Um, it's not as regimented as, as I discussed on the business impact analysis, although the BIA process does work. 
Um, again, if you want to contact me offline, I can maybe highlight a little activity that I've done for my graduate students to get them to understand the, uh, the difference between uh, uh, business continuity planning and um, um, continuity of operations planning. Don, is my sound coming through yet? It just did now. Thank you. All right. You want to? Uh, you got any any questions for us, Tom? Great. Um, so, just wanted to you know mention to everybody. Uh, definitely plug your questions into that chat area. There's actually two areas for questions. One is the Q and A, and one is the chat area. And uh, and Don, I do have one question. Um, I think. Spending money on business continuity and really making it a priority, getting leadership involved, those seem to be major challenges with any organization, whether you're a corporate enterprise or a local government or any organization that's trying to focus on continuity. Um, do you have any tips for making the business case and, and selling it to leadership? There's an activity I do in my graduate course, and there's a couple of different case studies that we use of, of companies that have gone through business continuity planning and found ways to streamline their business um, and achieve greater efficiency. And that the payback with that greater efficiency more than offset the cost for the business continuity program. Um, I think that that is certainly one. Number two is one of, of customer requirements, meeting customer requirements. Um, today, business continuity planning oftentimes is, is a customer requirement, although most customers don't audit. Some do, some industries require auditing. Um, but if we take a look at the number of um, um, requests for proposals that now include questions on business continuity, if there's a, a good program in place um, and you can, you can make a very convincing um, statement about your resiliency that could factor into your greater prospects of some of your sales or maybe not being um, eliminated from competition because you don't have a point in place. Um, but I think that the, you know, the, the topic of resiliency um, is, is building that culture. So when something happens, you have in place the, the, the systems, the processes, the people and knowledge to be able to quickly get a handle on what's happening and be able to address that. And companies have greater confidence afoot um, because they have that demonstrated you know, capability to deal with you know, what happens from time to time. Um, tough to quantify that. But if anybody wants to contact me offline, I mean, I can point them to a couple of different articles that they may wish to read. And I think you have a slide for uh, contact information at the end. Feel free to advance there. Um, and, and also, Don, I think one of the um, challenges is finding that each organization seems to be a little different to, as far as who owns it or who's all involved in business continuity. Not every corporation or organization has a business continuity program manager or full-time, um, but where do you think it makes most sense to have business continuity fit within an organization? I think business continuity is about operations. So if it's placed within operations, at a high level within operations, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but I find it placed in many different parts of a company. So when we go back to standards, the standards don't dictate where it needs to be. It speaks to the program and, and, and the elements of the program and so forth. But since a lot of this is about operations, you know, it needs to be within operations. Certainly IT is also gonna have um, a key role in, in terms of the IT disaster recovery planning. And there's gonna be a real strong line of communication and coordination between operations and IT. Good points, um, and I don't see any more questions coming in li online, but if you do have another one, uh, feel free to either email it to Don or myself, um, and as a uh, kind of incentive to, uh, or perhaps a reward to all of our webinar participants, 
I just posted something in the chat area, a special offer just for webinar attendees. Uh, we're teaming up with Habitat for Humanity, and uh, you'll get 25% off any uh, anything, any courses that you enroll in at safeandready.org. Um, that's the Safe and Ready Institute home. Um, so if you enroll in any courses, you'll get 25% off and 75% of that purchase will be donated to Habitat for Humanity. Uh, that's now through April 7th. And I think what's most interesting uh, for everybody on the line is the virtual summit, which is coming up in September. We're going to have a business preparedness virtual workshop where we'll hear from many uh, business experts. So um, there's the free pass, and there is a lot of free content on safeandready.org, whether it's training courses uh, or the virtual summit free pass. So do check that out. And Don, I know you have some really good giveaways. Any Anything to uh, mention before we wrap up here? I just want to point everybody over to that um, updated self-assessment checklist. I think it's uh, it's going to raise some great, great thoughts as you uh, further develop and implement your program. Um, so look to that. Um, and then you know, take a look at the resources, all the different links that are on the uh, the resources page of our website. There's a gold mine there. Uh, some when I curated the uh, the latest edition of that for the new website, I said, "Wow, that was a great resource," and and I'd kind of forgotten about it. So it was even good for me to go back through the list. Um, there are a couple of questions that are that I noticed in the chat log there, uh, Tom. If we've got a minute or two, I might be able to tackle one or more of those. Sure, go for it. Um, Nancy, you, you talked about an approach for planning for cybersecurity for non-IT resources. Um, I, I think that there is there's a, a great body of knowledge that's out there. And in fact, yesterday I just saw a great um, document from DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, on IT security for Wi-Fi networks. NIST has a lot of great resources out there. Um, and today, you know, so many different things. The Internet of Things, it's all connected to the web, but there's still some fundamentals. So if you want to contact me, I can point you to a couple of those resources that may help you to address um, your, your non-IT resources. Um, and I want to address uh, Veronica's uh, a question there. Hard drive failure could not be restored, you know, I always ask my students, I said, how many of you had a hard drive failure? And a bunch of people raise their hands. And then I say, for the rest of you, it's just a matter of time. Um, so you use the cloud. And uh, I would say the cloud is a great resource. Um, I use one for my business. Um, but what I do is periodically I go in and I go to that backup and I validate that I'm able to restore from that. And what I found was that oftentimes these cloud providers have a certain types of files that they, they will back up automatically. They'll search hard drives, they'll identify those and automatically back them up. The problem is that there may be files of yours, and I found this to be true, files that should have been backed up that were not backed up. Um, and also your program files, um, those are not automatically backed up for some providers. And in that situation, you need to make sure that your um, product key um, is saved, so if you have to reinstall it, download and reinstall it from the vendor, you have that information. So that's, an, that's part of the vital records I talked about earlier on. But cloud is, is great, just like anything else, trust but verify. Um, I think that's about the, the last question that I have here. Uh, if I missed anybody, uh, please contact me offline. I'd be happy to speak with you on the phone or address your email. Tom, back to you. Excellent. Thank you, Don. Again, that's Donald Schmidt. He is uh, CEO of Preparedness LLC and certainly a business continuity, crisis management, emergency management expert. So thank you, Don, for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, this recording will be posted on safeandready.org. That's safeandready.org. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you all uh, for joining us across the U.S. and have a good day. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, everyone.